And for more on Ukraine and the day's top political stories, let's bring in Nicole Killian and Sarah Westwood. Nicole is CBS News congressional correspondent, and Sarah is political and investigative reporter for The Washington Examiner. Hi, both of you. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, Nicole, I want to start with you. And I'm curious, is there any clear path forward in Congress for this additional funding to Ukraine? Well, there is. I mean, look, both Democrats and Republicans have made clear that they think that this should be a priority and move with urgency. And that is something that senators are reiterating once again today on Capitol Hill. But the devil is really not so much in the details of this Ukraine supplemental package, but more so in how they get it done, whether or not uh, this package will move unilaterally or whether Democratic leaders will attempt to tie this to other funding packages. For instance, we know the White House has uh, called for additional funding to address the pandemic. They want about $10 billion in aid for uh, resources uh, to deal with that. And so Democratic leaders, uh, specifically Speaker Pelosi, have suggested that they favor potentially tying these two things together. Well, just today, you had Republican leaders pouring cold water on that idea, saying that that is something that uh, they don't want to see, that they would prefer that these packages move separately, and also uh, giving the warning that if, uh, for instance, these packages are tied together or if and when there is a decision, for instance, made on COVID funding, uh, that they do feel that that should also potentially be a referendum on this issue of Title 42. And as you know, uh, that is something that is currently in limbo in the courts, uh, this uh, pandemic expulsion policy, uh, which has been challenged illegally. But we know that many Republicans and even some Democrats would like it to stay in place. We know the Biden administration and many Democrats, uh, Democratic leaders would like to see it lifted. And so we saw this COVID funding actually bogged down a couple of weeks ago over this. And so it sounds like Republicans, once again, want to try to link this potentially to COVID funding. So the long and short of it is that this could get very complicated very quickly if lawmakers try to link all of these issues, Ukraine, immigration and COVID together. But it seems like the consensus is that perhaps that Ukraine funding should move separately. But again, Democratic leaders haven't specified how they'll proceed yet. Oh, my goodness, Nicole, the uh, <laughs> process for all of these things. Um, of course, I love how you say the devil's not in the details, but how they actually get it get it through. Uh, so we'll keep an eye on that. I mean, immigration is such a big issue right now. You mentioned Title 42. Sarah, I want to ask you a little bit about how the administration's handling some of these things. Um, the New York Times had a really interesting story out today that uh, reported that the president's top pollster told him last year that immigration and inflation would be huge problems problems for his administration and most likely Democrats in the midterms. So how is the White House trying to address these two issues now? That's really hard to say, Caitlin, because even though they've had, uh, now we know, more than a year of warning signs from within the party, and, you know, a lot of observers ha have, have been saying for months now that these were going to be huge issues. In the polling, we've seen voters increasingly rate these as their top concerns, more than COVID, more than the war in Ukraine, more than, you know, a number of other issues. And I'd add crime to that list as well, uh, to that list of issues that the Biden administration has seemingly ignored, uh, to put it harshly, until until they've become really major crises. And I think the problem is that the Biden administration for a lot of these months has been treating the issues as messaging problems. You know, if they could just find the right combination of words to talk about inflation, to talk about the situation at the border, then they could convince voters that everything was under control. But increasingly what they have are policy problems. They don't have substantive answers to how they are going to get a potential surge in uh, illegal migration at the border under control. They don't have substantial answers about how they are going to lower the cost of living for most Americans. And so voters, I think, are starting to recognize that. And it could be at this point, you know, six months out from the midterms, too little too late in terms of the Biden administration's ability to take policy steps to address those problems. All they really have left is the messaging angle, and that just might not cut it for them.
Yeah, this administration has been saying that um, the economy looks good on paper, but they also know, of course, that people measure their own personal economies by filling up their gas tank and how much it costs, going to the grocery store and how much it costs. So and their personal economies, what they're doing to address that is something to, to look out for. Um, I want to keep on this issue of immigration, though, Nicole. I mean, you mentioned Title 42 and kind of the divisions within the Democratic Party on this issue. Um, it's set to expire on May 23rd, which is just in a few weeks here. Um, what are you hearing about what Congress might do with Title 42? I mean, you mentioned the previous attempts to attach it to COVID funding. Is that still likely, or kind of how can Congress handle this? Well, again, that is something that Senate Republicans reiterated today, uh, namely uh, Senate uh, Whip uh, John Thune, who told reporters uh, earlier today that uh, he does think that there should be some type of uh, vote uh, with respect to Title 42. Too, and he thinks that the best way to litigate that is potentially with this COVID funding package. As I mentioned, you know, the preference, at least from Republican leaders, is to move the Ukraine package separately. Uh, but in terms of this COVID funding, which we know, again, is also a priority of the administration, uh, Republicans have made clear that they might try to, again, bring up Title 42, as they did uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And the issue there is that there are a number of vulnerable Democrats who uh, do have reservations about this policy being lifted, who could potentially hand the administration a defeat uh, if there were some type of vote to move forward. And so when you attach it to something like a uh, COVID bill, then it could potentially uh, jeopardize that funding. So that's kind of the conundrum. I would also note uh, that uh, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas is expected uh, back on the Hill again this week. He appeared before several House panels last week. This time, he will appear before a pair of Senate panels, and he really faced a lot lot of tough questioning uh, from both sides of the aisle, quite frankly, uh, but really a lot of pointed questions uh, in particular uh, from Republicans on this policy, uh, on, in their view, uh, not doing enough to secure the border, some even suggesting that he should be impeached over this and could potentially uh, face that uh, should Republicans take the majority this fall. Yeah, you can imagine a lot of Republicans using some of those clips in campaign ads uh, this this fall. Um, I, I want to kind of, you know, talk about a little bit of the political fallout uh, coming here. Sarah, a, a recent uh, poll, at Washington ABC News poll, Washington Post ABC News poll, um, there's something really interesting. It, it, it asked Americans, which political party do you trust to do a better job handling the economy? And it shows that 50 percent of those polled said Republicans and 36 percent said Democrats. Now, if you're a Democrat running for re-election this time, that number probably isn't something you're welcoming. Uh, we know the economy is going to be huge in these midterm elections, but it, we're in primary season right now. We have that big race in Ohio tomorrow, for example. Is this issue of the economy playing out in, in primary so far? And if so, how, how so? Yeah, absolutely. I think it sort of has the effect in primaries of making the typical red meat that you see on both sides of the aisle less important because voters don't really want to hear, you know, the sorts of sensational stuff, identity politics on the left, you know, the, the types of incendiary things that Republicans normally say when they're having trouble, as, as you mentioned before, filling up their gas tanks and going to the grocery store. So you mentioned that Ohio Senate primary, you know, we've seen a surprising surge in that primary in a relatively red leaning state from a candidate matt dolan who is not throwing a lot of red meat out there who's just talking about energy production and the economy and you know getting more funding for law enforcement he's just talking about those bread and butter issues and in a situation where the political backdrop is maybe more stable then you're going to have fire brands potentially perform better in primaries because only you know the most hardcore voters will turn up to a midterm primary when it's not a presidential year it's not necessarily an exciting type of race but right now voters have a lot of fatigue from all of the political drama and they just want to hear about the issue so on the left and the right i think it's steering a lot of candidates away in the primaries uh, from those more fringe issues they they just want to hear candidates talk about the economy and, and their safety yeah, basic fundamentals, I, I guess you could say. Um, and, Nicole, before we let you go, I know you've been doing a lot of reporting on the January 6th committee and its preparations to have public hearings. Who are they looking to call for testimony?
Well, they're looking to present uh, a number of things, you know, whether that is uh, showcasing exhibits, uh, whether that could be staff testimony, testimony from outside witnesses. But their goal is to really paint a picture and a narrative of what happened step by step by step. And so we do expect those hearings to get underway in earnest in June. Chairman Benny Thompson told me the hearings are expected to start June 9th. And so uh, those hearings would be spread out throughout the month of June. Uh, worth noting that uh, today, of course, you have the committee reaching out to a number of Republicans uh, that they now want to appear before the committee, not so much in a hearing capacity, but at least to voluntarily come before the committee to talk about what they know. And that includes uh, Congressman Andy Biggs, uh, Congressman Mo Brooks, as well as Congressman Ronnie Jackson of Texas. And so, uh, for instance, in the case of uh, Biggs, uh, they believe that he was engaged in some conversations surrounding the planning of January 6th and want to hear more from him about that. Uh, in the case of Mo Brooks, uh, it is statements that he has made in his Senate uh, campaign recently uh, about uh, President Trump uh, allegedly telling him to rescind uh, the 2020 election. Uh, this was after the former president uh, pulled his endorsement of Mo Brooks. And then in the case of Ronnie Jackson, uh, the committee says it has questions about uh, uh, the Oath Keepers group and uh, the group uh, potentially trying to provide protection for Congressman Jackson uh, ahead of January 6th, because they believed he had some vital information. So, again, the committee still trying to talk to a number of people before they get these hearings underway in June. Calling in their own colleagues. That'll be very interesting to watch this summer as those get underway. Uh, Nicole Killian and Sarah Westwood, we covered a lot of ground today, so thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate your time and reporting.